everyone! Today we are talking about the Victorian and the Edwardian period. I've heard these terms used nearly interchangeably online, so I thought it would be interesting to have a look at their similarities and differences. Both of these terms delimitate a particular time period directly connected to the ruling English monarchy. Queen Victoria's coronation took place in 1837 and she died in 1901. This is the Victorian period. King Edward VII came to power in 1901 and died in 1910. This is the Edwardian period. Both of these terms refer to these specific time periods in a British context, though often they are applied in other parts of the world. These two terms are applied to nearly everything – art, dress, architecture, etc. In terms of dress, the Victorian period was much longer and so had a lot more developments. The silhouette changed every decade, some with pretty significant changes due to technological advancements, such as still crinoline. I thought we could do a quick summary of each decade, but <laughs> disclaimer, there is so much that can be said about dress, fashion, hair, shoes in each of these decades that I'm only taking the highlights, general visuals, brief overlooks. Some fashions came in style and were out within months or years, and I just don't have the time here to investigate it all. So let's start with the 1830s. Queen Victoria came to power in 1837, quite late in the decade, just at the tail end of what is often referred to as the Romantic Era. Skirts had continued to widen from the 1820s onwards, and big sleeves were common, but by the end of the decade the gigot sleeve was tightening at the top. These proportions created a dramatic triangular visual, which made the waist seem smaller. You might recognise these looks from films like The Young Victoria, which is set just before and during and right after Queen Victoria's coronation, and TV series like Gentleman Jack, which opens in 1832. The 1840s Romanticism was on the way out, and the 40s saw a more restrained and sombre look. Think Bronte sisters aesthetic. This decade was pronounced by long waists and tighter sleeves. The hems continued to widen into a bell shape supported by several petticoats, which could range from 2 to 7 by the end of the decade. Cartage pleating, or gorging as it was called at the time, made a comeback as it was useful to fit large amounts of fabric to the waist. Bodices had a sharp point at the front and often pleating or bodice details that suggested a V-shape and sloping shoulders. You might have spotted these styles in TV shows like Victoria and films like Jane Eyre the 1850s. The ever-expanding hem continues into the 1850s. Emphasis remains on a small waist with drooping shoulders. The initial bell of the 1840s becomes fully realised in the dome shape of the 1850s. The sheer amount of fabric needed for these skirts required a lot of support, usually from several petticoats. In 1856, the first steel cage crinoline was patented. It created a solid and more lightweight way to achieve large shapes, so skirts continued to increase into the 1860s. A more natural waist was preferred and sleeves expanded once again. Not into Gigo sleeves, but sleeves often called pagoda. Pagoda? 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 Tiered skirts also became fashionable. Think cupcake. <laughs> I couldn't think of any specific TV shows or films I've seen that are clearly set in the 1850s. So let me know down below if you know any. I think technically David Copperfield was published in the 1850s, so maybe? The 1860s. Skirts finally achieved their maximum expansion. <laughs> the craze of the crinoline reached its epitome. Epitome? Kieran! Kieran! The craze of the crinoline reaches epitome in this decade. They became mass-produced and sold everywhere. The wide skirts are heavily criticised across periodicals and contemporary cartoons. The shape of the skirt started to change, and by the end of the decade, the skirts featured a flat front and then room in the back, creating an elliptical shape. Bodices remained fitted with a short waistline, long sleeves and high necklines for the daytime, and low off-the-shoulder necklines and short, sometimes puffed sleeves for evening wear. Young women sometimes wore a skirt and blouse combination during the day. Any film regarding the American Civil War will be set in the 1860s, whether accurate or loosely, like Gone with the Wind, The Beguiled and Little Women. The 1870s Since the skirt emphasis migrated towards the back, it was no surprise that the crinoline should adapt to do the same. 
The early years of the 1870s saw the appearance of the first bustles. The shape was achieved by foundation garments, such as horsehair petticoats or crinolettes. It was common for skirts to be heavily decorated with ruffles, gathers and pleated trims. Bodices remained tight with the short waist of the 1860s and Basque's Gabrielle dresses were fashionable. Their bodices often had v-necks or square necklines. However, in 1876, the princess line dress, popularised the name for Alexandra, the Princess of Wales, was introduced. This is sometimes called the natural form area by us modern people. These dresses had no horizontal waist seam and was instead fitted with long darts, creating a much more fitted silhouette and did not have bustles. Some dresses consisted of a separate bodice and skirt and had one bodice for the day and one for evening wear. Daniel de Ronda is set in the 1870s and so is the Paradise, both by BBC. The 1880s. The princess dresses remained popular in the early years of the 1880s, which was very snug to the body and continued to emphasize the back by trains and drapery. This brief interval from the bustle ended around 1883, 1884, when the bustle returned with a vengeance. The bustle was so pronounced, it often created a 90 degree angle and created what we can call the shelf butt. The vengeance was short lived, however, and by the end of the decade, the bustle had shrunk back into oblivion. The bodices featured high shoulders and narrow sleeves, with high necklines and often collars. The skirts usually featured over skirts heavily decorated with pleats and trims. I can't believe the only film I can think of is Victorian Abdul. Uh, please let me know if you know any 1880s films or TV shows down below. The 1890s. Ah. <laughs> In the early years of the 1890s, the bustle completely disappeared and it gave way to gourd skirts, bell shaped and fitted over the hips. Early sleeves had a small puff at the top, then replaced by the massive Gico inspired leg of mutton sleeves. The large sleeves helped emphasize a small waist. In the day-to-day -day wear, some men's fashion became an influence on women's styles, and ensembles consisting of skirts, shirtwaists and jackets became popular, alongside a rise in sportswear, such as cycling, golfing and tennis costumes. There were also some dress movements, such as the dress reform, aesthetic and artistic dress. We don't have time for all those. I can make a separate video if you're interested. Let me know down below. Towards the end of the century, the new healthy corset was introduced, influenced by some ideas popularized by dress reformers, called the straight front corset. Here is where we enter the Edwardian era, with the death of Queen Victoria in 1901 and King Edward VII reigned from 1901 until 1910, a much shorter time period. 1900s. There are a lot of fluctuations within this period. The Gibson Girl, a style which was already around in the previous decade, remained popular. Skirts and shirtwaists combinations for day and work wear became iconic for the time period. In the early years, the new straight front, or health corset, gained traction. This corset created what we often call the S-bend silhouette where it flattens the front and pushes the bust forwards and the hips back. Loose blouses and bodices emphasize the pigeon breast. Great. And gourd skirts were common, fitted over the hips and often with the train, depending on the time of day and occasion. We often also associate this time period with a profusion of lace. Of items such as lingerie dresses. By the end of the decade, the silhouette had softened to a more natural shape. So one of the reasons I actually wanted to make this video is because of this book. This book is called Authentic Victorian Dressmaking Techniques. However, if you open it, you will find the information that this book is based on a book originally published in 1905. And as you've learned throughout this um, video, that is just into the Edwardian period, period. So I was wondering about their choice of naming it. There are a couple of reasons why this could be named Authentic Victorian Dressmaking Techniques. Dressmaking techniques didn't change a whole deal in this time. Um, so it would make sense that they would, a lot of these are based on actual Victorian dressmaking techniques, which is why I imagine they would have picked this. Or, and the other thing is that it could be because Victorian seems to have a lot more weight than Edwardian. I think that's an interesting question to explore more. 
So the book is technically in the murky waters where it had just turned into the Edwardian period, but it might have started being written before, and so it could still be called authentic Victorian dressmaking techniques, or that could be a modern decision, because the original book this was uh, based on is actually called Dressmaking Up to Date, and I think this might just be a modern decision that they decided to call it authentic Victorian dressmaking techniques because Victorians are just more popular. But that's just something I wanted to point out in case you guys do get this. It's not to say that the techniques mentioned in here aren't Victorian. A lot of these techniques did cross over the decades. It's just that to keep that in mind that this was actually published in 1905. And that is all we have time for today. I hope you enjoyed this journey through the Victorian and Edwardian eras. And a big thank you to my top tier patrons, Alexa, Lourdes and Rhonda, and to all my patrons for making this video possible. Until next week.